Uh, yeah, you've already seen this now. Okay, so what is this? So I had um, you know, a desire to talk about uh, animations in video games, but usually when there's a lecture about these things, it's, uh, it comes down to what you previously have experienced and what techniques you're using. And it's super boring to me. Um, because in a way, you're not describing your thoughts and the mentality you go through um, you know, and how you got to choose those things is usually like a, you know, something that has something to do with art. And if you're a low-level animator, you tend not to have that much control over style, right? So you have to adhere to some rules. Um, you can boil it down this way, but it's not really helpful. The the purpose of this is to see what actually creates good animations, but it's all you know a question of taste, really. So it doesn't work out the same way that you think it would, you know. So you can't boil it down this way, even though it makes you know logical sense. So this is what I come up with. So in in regards to this, this is probably supposed to look a little bit more like uh, a pillar system, right? You start with yourself, and then you have higher and higher thoughts. I'll go into uh, each individual here um, a little bit further, so don't, don't worry about it right now. So what I want to do is um, talk a little bit about this, and then prove to you why it's important that we can have a conversation about animations. So. The, the best thing you can do in animation is just orientate yourself to results, right? So it, sorry. Uh, so it means that, um, you know, like, if it works, it works, right? You don't need to reinvent the wheel, but if there's a better way to make the wheel turn, that is the, that is the choice you can make. It, it sounds obvious, right? But not a lot of people do this. The next thing is to utilize theories. We're actually going to go through one theory, uh, and we're going to expand on that based on a couple of set of problems that we're going to see. Reading is what? <laughs> so, uh, the thing with the animations, I feel, is that it has to work as intended. If it's a happy accident, it's still an accident, right? Uh, it has to reach its targets of its intended use. And sometimes it's not that easy. Uh, sometimes you're just making animation for the sake of animations. We'll also see an example of that later on. Self. Mm. Uh, so this is a much harder thing, and it's going to be super boring. That's why I left it for last. Uh, but we'll get there. Anyways. So this is how I see it working. We're starting with the philosophy as a high-level uh, idea, and then we're boiling it down to a theory, and then we have the practicals for our game. Um, and this is basically how it would look if you are starting the, uh, the thought process, and then basically you're finishing up the assets. So as you can see, there is a high risk for catastrophic failure uh, further down the line. So you can have bad ideas, and it snowballs, and then you're stuck. And now you have to do animations based off of design or something like this, right? So it's important to have the right type of thoughts to begin with, otherwise you're going to get stuck. So, this sounds a little bit uh, weird, right? This uh, isn't all that uh, you know, understandable for now, but I'll give you a good example. So, uh, these are three images off of beans. The reason they're a little bit skewed this way is because I'm using a rolling shutter, and at high speeds, namely for thousands of a second, this is how they look, but they are actually spherical. They're moving in a direction, and for ease of use, uh, they're moving in either left, right, up, or down. Now, I would like you as an audience to make choices, right? and remember them for the next image. I will give you a little bit of time here to think. What direction is each individual bean going? Right? 
Does everybody have a theory about where they're supposed to go? You there. Are you done? No? <laughs> OK. Almost? <laughs> you need more time? So what I'm asking you guys to do, uh, again, is whether or not, f are you, do you think that it will go up or down, left or right? Make a choice for each individual, and I'm going to go to the next page now. Were you correct? How many of you got one right? Raise of hands. One, two. How many of you guys, or girls, uh, had two correct? And how many of you had all of them? OK, I, I can see that nobody was trying. OK, <laughs> okay this is going to be really fun for you guys next. <laughs> So, uh, what, can we, what can we add to, uh, to this? So I'm going to add some motion blur um, with this as well. So you can see this brown streak, right? Which is based off of this animation here. And I'm shooting it, obviously, at a very uh, much slower frame rate. So I can get this motion blur, right? So, we're going to simplify it a little bit. Now we know it's going to move up or down. There's no way that it's going to move sideways, right? So you're going to make another choice. Which of these are going down? Which of these are going up? One, two, three. How many of you got the first one correct? How many of you got the second one? How many of you got third? How many of you got all three? Right. So it's simple, uh, simpler, right? We basically excluded one direction, but we have two. So it becomes easier to recognize which direction it goes. And this is very meaningful in animation philosophy. It might sound like it's fucking obvious, but it isn't for a lot of people. And the same thing happens when you swing. So it doesn't need to be in a straight line, right? Because you still have what I would call um, you know, a double-ended arrow of time, essentially. So the arrow of time is, works a little bit differently because the way in which it works and how we can reinforce it is basically you have cause and effect, right? So you, there is no way in hell that, that this guy here is going to be smashing his head against the bean, right? He, he is getting hit by the bean. <laughs> Something you want to share with us? <laughs> Anyways, but you know, it's not it's not all that clear, and it's uh, you know you can add other other things to it, right? So here we see a karate guy, you know, b breaking blocks and stuff, and you can clearly see that the blocks are not going to reassemble themselves and push the kick back out, because not that's not how the arrow of time is working, right? So there is a line of action essentially. There is you can tell what happened with just this one imagery. And you can use this to a certain uh, you know, effect to reinforce other things. Here we see the classic uh, Batman and Robin cli uh, climbing a cityscape. Uh, and they're just pulling their, uh, their stuff here uh, you know, to make it look like they're doing uh, you know, a fantastic feat that would normally be impossible for actors. You can use this in a different way as well to reinforce like something that you haven't really seen before, wasn't really possible, you know? So you can use this uh, to your advantage. You can see this much clearly in, in anime and cartoons and so on where um, you only really have like one image to work with to begin with, you know? And you can see what's, what's happening here. But now it's up to the artist to basically define those lines and see where it's going. So you can almost imagine the animation here, right? You can see what's happening, and you can go like, oh, he punched him. You don't need to see the connecting punch anymore. Um, so one of my uh, favorite uh, mangas, uh, Vagabond, uh, is describing uh, uh, Miyamoto, uh, who is a sword saint, um, and he actually had a very interesting philosophy. Um, and he wrote a book called The Five Rings. And in The Five Rings, it's basically about 
self-mastery and how you can, you know, uh, by being a master of one art and you can like take it on and place it to something else. Which is really, really interesting to me because nobody taught me this, right? So there is a, there is a way of being able to uh, take something from A and place it on B and if you're good enough at the A, you are going to master B eventually. So, Let's talk about theories before uh, we, we jump on one of the, uh, the examples I'm going to give. So what I'm trying to say about theories is basically a workflow, a pipeline of sorts, where you are trying to um, think ahead before you actually do the, the work, right? So it's faster to think and to talk than to do. And that allows us to communicate with other people much better. Because you are in a project with somebody and you're going to describe what you're going to be doing. Your project manager is going to be happy when you can describe and quantify exactly what you're doing. But if you are going to say, I need to figure it out, give me two weeks, your project manager is not going to be happy. Your budget is going to run out, right? So you being able to much better um, you know, tell people about your, uh, your workflow, it's going to be better for everybody that is working around you, right? This is, this is partially why I'm talking more about video games than like VFX and stuff like that, right? So, um, when it comes to the practical parts, you can't hold a tool or a technique or a, a certain type of workflow as a, you know, a gold standard, like I always want to work like this, I always want to do it this way. It has to work for that specific situation first. Because if it doesn't, then it's not practical, right? And if it isn't practical, why, why use it? You can have a better theory, you can have a better pipeline. It has to be, have a, a proven track line of, of success, essentially. Right. So, uh, theories are... <sighs> You have, to, you have to let go of the ownership when it comes to theories because it has to be communal. It has to also be uh, sort of attackable. You have to have the opportunity of being wrong. If, you, if you, your theory cannot be wrong, it's religion, essentially, right? And you don't want to go there. So, um, you will have stuff in memory, and you will reuse it over and over again, which is okay, you know? It's not, uh, you, you don't need to invent, reinvent the wheel every time. It doesn't work that way. Um, but you could, you know, think about it and attack it from a different point of view, a different angle, right? Um, and you can modify it, you can add it on top. Uh, and it sort of grows, and it becomes like a master idea of how things work. And that's when you can teach juniors, you can give it to other people, and you know that this is going to work, which is what the theory should be, right? If you just keep it for yourself, it's useless, you know? So, we have a jumping problem. We have these three games, and these three games are having a, a jumping sequence, right? And they have a different set of problems. Now, if you want to, uh, you know, f solve these by applying, let's say, the... 12 principles of animation, you're not going to get that far, right? I, I guess everybody knows the individual games that I'm talking about here, right? So here, um, I just want to stipulate, this is sort of a bad gift that I <laughs> had to find. So what's happening here that uh, Freeman is actually running and crouching just before he hits the, the, the ledge. But uh, you don't really see that too much in the video, but I'm going to make it a little bit clearer. So, when applying the 12 principles of animation, I can't really see a lot of them, uh, you know, being applied here. Like, not, not really, anyways. You know, so I'm, I'm being generous when I'm using some of these, right? But it isn't the, the critical factor. So, to make it a little bit clearer, I made these animations and they're basically describing in analog what, uh, you know, the, what's happening in the, uh, in, in the scenes, right? So you have Shadow of Colossus on top, you have 
Half-Life on the bottom, and then you have Super Mario. Super Mario didn't really need an analog. It's, it's, it's 2D already, but I said, hey, I have time. So if you boil it down, you can see that it doesn't have as many frames as, um, I, I mean, the Shadow Colossus does not have as many frames as Super Mario, right? So you're, you're very limited of what you can do during those frame times. And that is what is going to stipulate how the animation looks. That's going to have a bit more of an effect than your skills to do uh, applying the 12 principles of animation, which sucks, right? Because that means that you're basically out treading water. You have no idea what you're doing. You just, oh, old ideas. Maybe it would work. You're throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, <laughs> so, now we have an attack problem, right? So you have a type of moment where, you know, the player is supposed to react, uh, the enemy is attacking you, uh, you, have a, you have a defense mechanism that you can, you can do something with, right? But how do you animate the attack so it's, it's a good attack? Well, first we have to think about how much time we have, right? Because that was something that we stipulated in the uh, example before this. So these milliseconds coming from the controller and the TV input and everything like that, they matter. Because if you apply that to your frame rate, you see that your reaction times now are going to have sort of an effect of you know, what's, what's going on on screen. So I've done this a little bit more helpfully and slowed it down. Sorry for walking in. Um, slowed it down a little bit. And you can see that there's large gaps with the red at 15 frames per second, right? So if you're, if you're making a high speed game, you kind of want it to run at 60. And you can see a bunch of games doing this already, like Platinum Games that does this. Uh, I think Bayonetta is running at 60 frames per second all the time. You know, and those are high paced games, right? Bullet hell games, you want to run at 60 frames per second because that gives the player an edge to play better, right? And you eSport players, they also play at like 144 hertz. So it helps even, even more. So if we take into account the average uh, response time of a, of a human, and then we apply the uh, kind of the antip anticipation and then the attack swing, and then we give the player a little bit of time to think, which is the red zone here. Um, that essentially means that, you know, we can already make stipulations of what is a, what is an easy attack, what is a hard attack, and what is memory only. What I mean by memory only is that it is happening so rapidly, so quickly, that you would have to see, have seen it first, once at least, before you can react to it. Because it's happening so fast, you have to do it via muscle memory. But, there is something else affecting this, right? So when you're um, making an attack, you know, some things are going to be more obvious and some things are going to be less obvious, right? So if you see the skeleton that is making the swing, you know, it's much more obvious what's, what's going on. Whereas if I'm, you know, holding, um, you know, a spear in a, in a certain way where you can't really see the depth at all, it becomes really, really hard. And I can take that moment of uncertainty and attack, right? And these have real-world examples. It makes it very, very interesting how to uh, make attacks. So our, our graph is actually wrong. You know, we didn't take into account these things. They look a little bit more like this, right? So if... If the, if the quality of, um, of what you're showing, if it breaks the silhouette much earlier, and if it's obvious, then you're starting at the bottom, which it has thick lines, you know, you have time to think, time to react. At the, at the top here, it looks like, uh, more like you sucker punch somebody, right? They weren't looking, and then suddenly you jab them in the face, right? And that could seem unfair to a lot of people. 
Another way of looking at it would be like this. So it goes from really shit to really good. So even if you add animation frames and you make your animations longer, you know, so you know, people can react, if it has a bad pose, it's not going to be readable, and therefore it has the same effect as if you removed um, you know, 10 frames out of 20 in order to um, make it faster or harder and so on. So you have to think about the pose as well. I hope you're not that confused, but uh, you know, all in all. So here's, the, uh, here's this first stipulation of the, um, the theory that I have. The requirements dictate, uh, dictate the appropriate length of the animations, right? So, the, so in Shadow of Colossus, I have to have an immediate reaction, right? I have to, I have to be able to jump sooner than later. The second one is the readability of the animation affects the purpose, which that is what we are discussing just recently. That's the uh, triangle, essentially, that is uh, becoming thicker at the bottom, thinner at the top. So we have the theory, which is stances ready for action, reduce length, increase readability at the cost of complexity. Something that is ready to pounce, ready to attack, takes less frame to, to finish. Um, how many of you have played Sekiro? How many of you have uh, made it up to the tower where you meet the blue samurai guy? Right. And you know how they're holding them, right? They're basically doing something like this, right? Which is very quick to do an attack from here. If I had to, do, if I had to stand like this, however, which is a little bit Dark Souls-y in some of the bosses, it takes, a, it takes a longer time to swing. But here, it becomes super hard because all I have to do is go down there. This doesn't take five frames. That's faster than any reaction speed a human has, you know? So it makes it harder. But the stance is already there, right? It doesn't need to do m much more because it's so close to the, uh, the actual attack um, end post, so to speak. But it also makes it more complex, right? So this is an Unreal, but you can, you, know, you can apply this to Unity or you know, whatever engine you're using, really. Um, so you have to keep in mind that you can't just add more stances to your animation. You know? It will help certain things, but it will make it more complex. Right? So you have to take that into account. But the, uh, you know, the, this stuff has you know, real-world applications, so you have um, you know, stances that were made to hide the weapon, to make it harder to be read. If I'm holding my sword in such, in such a way where you can't see the length, I gain an opportunity where I can make a swing and the opponent thinks that, oh, he will miss me. But I actually have a much longer reach than that person thinks. It's not just you know, Asian art style. There, this has also existed in you know, medieval European style. So this is a, um, I don't actually have that much data uh, on whether or not this is actually a fighting stance for women, but it's named after women. Uh, posta di Donna Sinestra. Donna means female. And the way in which it works is basically that you're resting your uh, your sword on your, on your shoulder. That's why you have these huge pauldrons sometimes, right? And you can go from here and rest, so you don't need to hold your sword up in the air and tire out your arms. You can just go from here to here. If you want, you can go from here to here, and you have even more of a reach, right? In certain circumstances, you can also you know, swing around that way and, and everything, which is Super awesome. So you have a lot of you know, real-world examples uh, that you can see recorded throughout history. So now we're going to take this a little bit further. So you can see that um, stances that are ready for that type of action, it's, it's going to benefit you uh, to get there uh, you, you know, a little bit sooner by uh, being ready for 
whatever you're supposed to do. So here I have the same foot placement, but I am um, purposefully moving in a way uh, that benefits my, my stance. So instead of, instead of uh, basically rolling, uh, well, lifting up my feet over and over again, um, you know, I can just swing and it's much faster. It doesn't work for everything, but it's, it's a truth, right? It doesn't need to be uh, sort of, well, how should I put it? doesn't need to be corrected. But there is a limitation to how much you can use this, right? A heavy character wouldn't necessarily swing around that way. So, which foot comes first? Which of these do you think um, you should be using and for what reason? This is sort of a question for philo the philosophy bit, right? So, technically, neither of these are wrong. You can use both of these, but you're actually making a locomotion system with this, these type of steps. So you have to think further than just how it looks from this single asset. You have to think about them as a, a part of a locomotion group. In the same way, I was adding more and more factors to my um, attack stances and stuff like that. There's more data coming in. So, if I take the um, if I take the this animation, I can improve it a little bit, and I've I had to stipulate this for you guys so you don't see that you know it's it's basically crossing the the streams and doing something you know physically impossible. But then, if I take in in example how it would be if I took uh, you know the stretch or um, squash uh, further or, or slash closest approach, you can see that there is, a, there is a difference in speed now, even though I'm basically lifting the legs and pressing them down, basically at the same timing, right? This makes it a little bit easier to see. And you can see that I am now able to blend between uh, you know, these animations and my, my step arounds, right? I can now create a locomotion system based of this. So, I at some point, if I'm using the controller, I can go like, okay, I want to turn around. No, I want to actually walk in this direction, right? This allows for more mobility. You're, you're not uh, marrying the, uh, the button input like you would in, in most other games. Here you can see them on top of each other, and you can see clearly uh, the green arrow wins. It has a faster response time in that sense. I get much further in the same duration. Now you can say like, well, you could, you could swing around like this. There's nothing preventing you from doing that, right? It's just that it looks goofy. And the problem with this is, you're basically swinging out your, your root, right? So it's not moving directly to the left or right. It's doing like this type of curvature, and the programmers will kill you when they see an asset like this. Because they kind of want to move every, everything, you know, with uh, you know, entity force, like, oh, move, move left uh, with a lerp instead of having that like an animation clip. And you can see here that even though I've slowed this down a little bit, so it looks a little bit choppy, even though like um, you can basically maintain the same speed, you see that the uh, the red foot here is actually moving incredibly fast to keep up the same pace as the the right foot, the right green foot here. So it looks even more unnatural. So you shouldn't do this, even though you could. And you shouldn't marry into that locomotion system just yet. You should think about it. Are we thinking too much about this? Maybe. Maybe not. But there are situations where animation has been made where you now have an opportunity to actually disable it. Why would you make an animation where you can disable it? That seems like a, you know, 
a shitty reason to make an animation to begin with. So in Far Cry, you have the skinning animation, right? And you skin animals. You have the option to turn that off. That seems ridiculous to me. Why would you have that to begin with if you know it's going to annoy the players? So, now we come to the self, which is um, a bit harder, a bit more boring. By the way, does anybody know uh, what this actually... There we go, awesome. The Pillars of Nosgoth. So there are a number of pillars here, but I'm not taking that into account. It's just a nice image. So the animator is essentially an athlete, right? Uh, and what does that mean? That means that if you're, if you're running, uh, your coach is going to be you know, checking w what you're eating, how you're sleeping, uh, you know, what you're doing during the day, if that's, if that's going to be working. And he's going to see, like, oh, this, this type of meal is better than that type of meal. You know, but we don't do that as animators in game industry. We just go to work every day and we expect, you know, improvement. This happens with other artists as well because self doesn't really change. It's, it's a foundation of who we are as, as human beings. Now, um, there have been, I, I basically just uh, took this from the internet. I just searched, does, you know, not eating have an effect on your mental capabilities. So it's not just the, the, the body that is being affected, it's also the brain. And it has been studied that, you know, it basically makes, if you don't eat correctly, if you don't have a safe home to go to, you're not going to be able to achieve academically. And what that means is you can't be even taught correct animations if you're not eating, if you're not doing these things. And that might seem you know, a little bit obvious to some of you, of course, you know, but a lot of, you know, developers, we don't eat, we don't sleep correctly, and then we are trying to do, like, masterful art, and it just makes no sense. You know, these things matter to, to your body and to your health and also to your coworkers, really. You're not going to treat somebody well when you're hungry and desperate for uh, some sort of, you know, relief. You're going to lash out, you know, it's not going to be pretty. Then we also have the overachievers, right, the, the workaholics. I am a workaholic, I know this. But the general guideline here is that, uh, and this is a quote from somebody else, um, of course. Um, there's a link above if you're interested to read more, or it's a YouTube, actually. It's going to be a little bit easier for you to listen to. But... Basically what this means is, if, if, you're, if you're working so hard that it damages your body, you're not going to be able to achieve something good afterwards, right? You're spent. The damage might be semi-permanent, and that is not a good thing, right? So you should work in such a way, optimally, if you still want to be a workaholic, if you still want to produce a lot of things, you need to work in a, such a way where it doesn't affect your next thank you. Uh, your next performance. So you can't have a performance where you're dancing and you're like cutting yourself off by the knee. You have no knees, you have no legs. How can you do a next performance? That's a once in a lifetime type of thing then. Is it worth it? Probably not. Yeah, uh, I thought it would be a little bit longer, but uh, it wasn't really. I know this is going off as you know, the kind of whimper in the uh, uh, at the end here, but uh, it is also the most important bit when it comes to um, you know the the, f the whole philosophy aspect. You have to respect that it's coming from uh, you know a human being and it's going to another human being. Um, and I know I've, I've been you know um, breezing through all of these topics and, and stuff like that, but it is important, and nobody talks about these specific points, right? So, thank you guys. Uh, I will happily take questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Sohail, for this mind-blowing <laughs> presentation. So, if you have any questions, please come to the stage. Any questions? Raise your hands, please. Oh, okay, coming. Uh, 
so yeah, while I was listening to your talk and watching your slides, I noticed that some of the things in animations that you've shown could be perhaps uh, solved using procedural animation. Does there exist a practical philosophy that can reconcile the fact that some things are better achieved with a programmer than animator? Yes. Um, I am, so I'm representing myself today, but I actually work for AMD. And we take uh, machine learning very seriously, right? And that is one of those things where, because in, in terms of a programmer and procedural uh, motion, you, you already have procedural motion. What you're looking for is quality. You can, you can already move an object from A to B, you know, but you want it to look nice when it does that, right? So the question is, how do you achieve that? Well, you can do this by, via machine learning. You know, you could have a, a sort of a, a large data set and you can try to replicate it through examples. But uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, programming on a whole, I would say that, um, you know, like the, the type of uh, procedural animations that people are looking for is usually um, due to time constraint from the, from the animator or you don't have the budget to even have an animator, right? So you have to kind of uh, cut down on the extra bits, if that makes sense. So you don't, you make, you make something that doesn't require an animator to begin with. And suddenly your animation quality is, you know, uh, be believed to be much better than it actually is. Because it doesn't need to go that far, right? Uh, there are multiple games where you kind of see, um, you know, pixel art and, and stuff like that. That doesn't necessarily have that much animation into it, but you have like a little bit of anticipation, a little bit of jump. You can do that as a squash and stretch, you know, and that's just parameters, really, you know. Um, so when you're not expert in a, f in a field that you're trying to excel at, you have to cut down a little bit, right? So start small. That's that's what I would say, uh, you know, in, in terms of animation philosophy in procedural work. But if you're a big data center, you know, go nuts. Do, do machine learning. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Okay, if there are no questions, then thank you very much once again. Thank you.